Good morning, everyone. We're about ready to start a new Sefer of Nach, the Sefer of Ezra. Now, Ezra is a Sefer, obviously, that uh, is in many ways historical, but it also has some very, very important parallels for our day and age, because the issues that Ezra was dealing with was in the era of Jews returning to Israel, Jews remaining in the diaspora, a, a, unfortunately, a, a terrible situation of intermarriage that was taking place among the Jews in Eretz Israel, and the reestablishment, actually, of what we would nowadays call orthodoxy in those days, which was just plain old-fashioned Judaism, which had to establish. So in a sense, Sefer Ezra, even though it's not studied that much, really has tremendous lessons that can be taught for our day and age. Before we open, however, the text of Ezra itself, there's a number of historical pieces that we need to remember. Ezra is taking place in the very first year of Cyrus's reign. Now, as you will recall, Cyrus actually was preceded by Darius the Mede, and they had conquered Babylon. Persia and me, just like we just came off of Megillat Esther, Paras Umadai, that was the, the nation that took place. This is taking place 52 years after Churban Abayit, after the Beit HaMikdash has been destroyed. And in fact, on one of the many handouts that I sent, and I also printed and handed out, and I will bring it up as well in just a moment onto the screen, on one of those many handouts, you see it very, very clearly. Give me a moment and I'll, and I'll have it here for you, for those who are online. Um, I just want to see one more moment, I apologize. For the, okay, so for those who are online, um, you will see that in the timeline, uh, it's called Ezra 1 timeline, and I'll just uh, rotate it the right way so you can see it. No, it's actually this sheet. It's this sheet that I'm holding up. And for those who are online, I'm just sharing the screen with you just in case you don't have it. Okay. Okay. Now, that is a fifth one result. So it's this sheet. And just to make it very, very simple, there should be extra copies here. To make it very simple, what is happening on this sheet, if you notice this shorter arrow, the top of that shorter arrow begins with the exile of the Jews and the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash at the end of the reign of Tzidkiyahu. 52 years pass, 52 years pass, and in the course of those 52 years, we see the downfall of Nebuchadnezzar, Avil Merodach, Belshazzar is then conquered by Daryavesh. Daryavesh the first has, the Mede, has the monarchy for approximately one year, and then Cyrus the Great takes over afterwards. So we're 52 years after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Now, to just make it a little more interesting, and for those of you online, I apologize. I didn't send out this link, uh, but I can do it as well. Um, I just have to, again, pull it up. I printed for everyone a, uh, a really fascinating, it's not mine, it's a, obviously it's a summary that was done of this entire era. And the summary comes from a, uh, a scholar, and it's actually, I found this on 929 uh, in their introduction of everything. 929 is that wonderful source that has all of the, uh, uh, and, and the 929 prakim of, of Tanakh. And on this sheet, if you look, that this, and it's an 11 by 17 sheet. If you look, it has a summary of all of the kings and information. It may not be graphically the most pleasing to the eye, but if you notice what's happening right here, and if you go a little bit up, you'll see Tzidkiyahu, he's in, he's in yellow. His reign began in 590, uh, 597, according to our markings. Then 
After Tzidkiyahu comes the Churban Habayit, if you notice, and again, we have Hatzarat Koresh, which is the decree of Koresh. Now, before Tzidkiyahu, and just to remember these pieces, we had two other kings. In other words, the last three kings of the southern kingdom was Yehoiakim ben Yoshiau HaMelech. He was either killed or was taken captive. There's a disagreement between Sefer Melachim, which lets us understand that he was killed, and Sefer Divrei Amim, which lets us understand that he was taken captive. And we dealt with him when we were learning Melachim Bet, where it most likely was he was taken captive and died and then was, was brought back for his burial. So he would be able to be buried next to his father, as Sefer Melachim points out. After Yehoiakim came Yehoiachim. Yehoiachim ruled for a very brief period of time. He was just three months. Yehoiachim, we encountered a Megillat Esther. Im Yehonia Melech Yehuda, that Mordechai or one of Mordechai's ancestors was taken into the exile of Babel together with the king Yehoiachim. Yehoiachim is taken into exile 11 years before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And then again, Tzidkiyahu HaMelech. And on this chart, there's a lot of information here. I'm not going to go into all of it, but I did have it and I wanted to share it. And for those of you who like information, it's all there for you. So we know that 598 Yehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar comes to power. 598, 590, I'm sorry, 598 Nebuchadnezzar comes takes away Yehoiakim or kills him. Three months later, Yehoiakim is taken into Babel. The closing scene of Sefer Melachim Bet, if you remember, was Yehoiakim was brought to the king's table, that he was elevated, but he was still in, Ga huh? Yehoiakim. Pretty sure, <laughs> yeah. The final king, Tzidkiyahu HaMelech, who was put into power and who was defeated at the time of the Khurban in 586, okay, um, is when the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash came. Hopefully I have that correct so far. Okay, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure on that. Now, the other couple of pieces that we need in, to, in order to understand what's going on. I did send to everyone this chart, to those of you who got it online, it was in black and white. This is a summary actually of who's doing what during Sefer Ezra and Nehemiah. And you'll see that we are in this second column. It's set, the second column says that the decree of, of Koresh, Hatzarat Koresh, Manhigim Shesh Batsar, we're not really sure who Shesh Batsar was, a number of different possibilities. There was no active Navi at this moment, even though Chagai's Chariyo Malachi, the last three Naviim are running parallel at that time. The Persian king is Cyrus. And this is all found in the first chapter of Ezra, which we're going to deal with. The final piece of information, just as introduction, actually the second to the final piece of information. So I guess the penultimate piece of information that we're going to have right, right now is another document that I shared with all of you. And that's the document which is titled Cyrus, uh, the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, the Cyrus Cylinder is a very important doc. It, it's a document, but it's actually a cylinder. It's found in the British Museum. If you have a chance to go visit the British Museum, it's one of those things that's really worth seeing. It's on the second floor. It was on the second floor in its own case. It is, this is a picture of the Cyrus Cylinder in it. And the Cyrus Cylinder was found and it conveys the history of Cyrus. And it talks about where Cyrus captures Babylon and this is a translation. Uh, and if you look, he ordered him to go to the city of Babylon. He said, and this is Marduk, the, 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 their God. He set him on the road to Babylon like a companion and a friend. He went at his side, etc. And if you look, verse 20, or line 20, actually, it's not verse, line 20 in the cylinder, I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king, mighty king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four quarters, the son of Cambyses, great king, king of Asan, grandson of, of Cyrus, great king, king of Ansan, descendant of, of Tesbis, great king, king of Ansan. 
Okay, we move a little bit further down and you switch to the second sign, to the religious, that second side, to the religious measures. And this is what's really significant for us in this conversation. And I, uh, I apologize to those online, I'm trying to get to the second side. Religious measures. And in peace before him, we moved around in friendship by his exalted word, all the kings who sit upon thrones throughout the world from the upper sea to the lower sea, who live in the districts far off, the kings of the west who dwell in tents, all of them brought their heavy tribute before me in Babylon, they kissed my feet from Ashur and from Susa. Okay, so Persia and Assyria all pay tribute to Cyrus the Great. And then 32 and 33 are the real reason why I duplicated this for you. I returned the images of the gods who had resided there to their places and let them dwell in, dwell in eternal abodes. I gathered all their inhabitants and returned them to their dwellings. In addition, at the command of Marduk, the great Lord, Marduk, by the way, is where the name Mordechai comes from. Okay, Mordechai was, his Persian name was, was the name of a Persian god, as was Esther, the name of a Persian god. I settled in their habitations and pleasing abodes, the gods of Sumer and Akkad, whom not only need this, to the anger the Lord of the gods had brought into Babylon. Now, the reason why this is significant is because based on the Cyrus cylinder, we know that the early policy of Cyrus was very different than the policies of the Babylonians. The Babylonians, to create for themselves that security, they exiled leadership and people from one country and moved them to the next. And what they tried to do by this population exchange, we talk about it in Halacha, that already the Assyrians did it, and they began the population exchanges. What they felt is that the people don't have a sense of home, they won't be able to rise up in the same way and rebel. Cyrus felt the other way. And what Cyrus felt was important is to give people the power to return to their homes and to worship their own gods. He returned and allowed the rebuilding of temples of all of the people who had been captured by the Babylonians. Now, in, among those peoples who he allowed, and this was part of his regular policy, were the Jews. And the Jews were allowed at this point to return to Eretz Yisrael 52 years after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, and will read this of Cyrus in just a moment, they were allowed to return back and to start building. Now, the 52 years is obviously not the 70 years. And this is the one last piece which we need to remember. And the last piece we need to remember is Yirmiyahu. And there are two places in Yirmiyahu Hanavi where he talks about the 70 years. We've talked about the 70 years of exile. There's actually three places we encounter the 70 years of exile. One we learned in Sefer Daniel in Perak Tet. If you remember Shivim, Shvulayim, et cetera, there was this very difficult uh, calculation of numbers followed by a prayer of Daniel. He referred to it. Daniel is a contemporary at all of, where all of this is taking place. We then encounter in the 25th chapter, for those of you who have Tanachim, in the 25th chapter of Yirmiyahu, we encounter his first prophecy that talks about the um, 70 years of exile. And he says in Pasuk Chet, in Perak Chafhe, Chapter 25, verse 8, he's quoting God, because you have not listened to my word. God says, because you haven't listened, listened to me, I'm going to send out Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to send out Nebuchadnezzar to come and bring all of the people up to Babel. And I'm going to utterly destroy them. I'm going to destroy the sounds of joy and the sounds of weddings. 
Kol rechaim ve'orner, and I'm going to destroy commerce, the the grinding mill, the mills, and and the, the light. Vaitakol arut sazot lecharba, the shama. It's going. This land is going to be destroyed. Va'avdu agoyim ha'elat melech bavel shivim shana, and they're going to serve the king of Bavel for seventy years. Vayak chimlot shivim shana, and after the uh, fulfillment or the, 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 the full 70 years, and then I will bring upon them after 70 years, I will remember, if code. I will remember, just like we have back in Bereshit, Vashem Pakadet, Sarai, remember, I'll remember the sins of these nations, and at that point, they will be destroyed. That's place number one. Place number two is found in Yirmiyahu Perek Haftet. And Yirmiyahu Perek Haftet Pasuk Aleph is even more important for our purposes of understanding what's going on here. This was delivered probably seven years before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Again, Yechonyam was exiled to Bavel, eleven years before he and the great and the, and the the officers, the you know the 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 noblemen and the leadership of Eretz Yisrael of Yehuda were exiled eleven years before, probably about four years later, Yirmiyahu gives this prophecy. This is the text of the book that was sent by Yirmiyahu. Hanavi from Yerushalayim, El Yeter Ziknea Gola, to the remaining of the elders in the exile, Vela Kohanim, Vela Nevi'im, Vel Kol Ha'am, and to the Kohanim and the Nevi'im who went into exile and to all of the people. Now, interestingly, the remaining elders most likely means that uh, it's referring be, to the fact that in the course of being taken into exile, many people died along the way. Um, it, it is not that far off to imagine that the march of the exiles were similar to death marches during World War II of the Nazis. These people are being taken off in chains and being marched hundreds of miles. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but when it says Yetar Zignea Gola, aren't there some kingdoms still left in Yerushalayim at this point? Therefore, right. There are some who are in Yerushalayim or elsewhere in Israel, and there are some who are in Yerushalayim. Well, Yibola. but Yeter means a remaining amount. It doesn't mean, in other words, if I, would, I could have said, if I'm referring to the ones who are just in the Gola versus the ones who are in Yerushalayim, I could have written El Ziknei HaGola. I don't need the word Yeter. Okay. So, Asher Heglan Vuchan. Netzar, Mirushalayim Bavel, Nebuchad Netzar taken out into exile. Achritzet Yechonia Hamelech, okay, we now know this was part of the exile of Yechonia, Vahagvira, and also the queen mother or the king mother. Vahasari Sim, Sare Yehuda, Yerushalayim, and all of the um, the, the ministers of, of Yehuda and Yerushalayim, Vacheresh, Vamaskir, Yerushalayim, and all of the other people, Keresh and Masker, are interesting terms we find. They can be defenders and they can also mean the lower class. Bayad el Ashab and Shafan, this might be Shafan, your son of Shafan, who we had encountered once before when they found the Sefer Torah, when they found the Sefer Torah in the Beit HaMikdash. This letter was sent by Elasha, Ugmarya. Ben Chilkia, Asher Shalach, Tzidkia, Melech Yehuda, Nebuchadnezzar, Melech Bavel, Bavel, Lemur, who had been sent by Tzidkia. Ko Amar Hashem Tzvakot, Elokei Yisrael. Now this is the text of the letter. Thus said Hashem, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Lechol HaGola, Asher Higleti Mirushalayim Bavel, to the diaspora, to the exiles that I've exiled to Bavel, Benu Vatim Veshevu, Venit Uganot Vichlu Et Piryan, settle in, okay? Build homes, plant gardens, eat, get married, and have children, and marry off your children, and multiply there and don't hold back from having families. And seek peace with the places that you have been exiled to. And pray on behalf of the places where you've been exiled to, 
pray to God for them. Because if they're at peace, you'll be at peace. Because this is what God has said. Don't lift up, don't pay attention to the prophets who are in your midst there in the exile and to the other magicians. And don't listen to, their, to the dreams. That you're dreaming. They're false prophecies. I never sent them. Because this is what I'm saying. Because it will be to the, to the end of 70 years, I will remember you. And I will fulfill my words, my good words, to bring you back. I know the plan, says God. What I'm, what's being planned is good and not bad. To give you a future and the next step, the next phase and hope. Ukratem oti v'halachtem. Okay, and call out to me, and you'll go. V'hit palaltem elayin and pray to me v'shamati alechem, and I will listen to you. V'kashtem oti u'metzatem, and you will seek me, and you'll find, and you'll be found. Ki t'hidrashuni b'chol levavchem. When you seek me with all of your heart. Now. The reason why I'm saying this chapter 29 of Yirmiyahu is even more significant for our purposes is because this chapter 29 lays out the ground rules of an exile. Up until this time, the only exile the Jewish people had known was the exile of Mitzrayim. They had never been in a diaspora. We had been in Mitzrayim, so the last time this has happened was 500 years earlier, 400 some years earlier, no, more than actually, I'm sorry, we're 586, almost a thousand, about 900, eight, 900 years earlier. I'm sorry, miscalculating. Um, it had happened, they had been, it was before the nation was formed. Now there are people in the exile. And what do you have to tell those people? Tell those people, listen, you have to go on with your lives. Not only do you have to go on with your lives, you have to build your lives. You have to create political alliances with the people who are there who were your exilers, who are the ones who are your enemies, pray for them. And now that you're in exile, the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. By the way, you can pray to me in exile. You were a country, you were a nation that was centered around Yerushalayim. Remember when, when Shlomo HaMelech built the Beit HaMikdash, he said that we're going to dive in towards this place. This is going to be the center of our worship. He's now saying you can worship in the Gola, in the exile. And then after 70 years, you're going to come back. So if you want to know, by the way, the basis of what we do in America today, your meow is the basis of how you live in a diaspora, how you're able to live in a diaspora and build lives in a diaspora. That's this. It's the third time we encounter your meow twice, chafhei and chavtet, your me and Daniel Perektet, we encounter this count of 70 years. The fascinating thing is, we don't know exactly when the starting point is, okay? And, you know, it's, there's these old jokes. People said, I, I will be, I'll finish this project in 24 hours. You know, they're never going to finish in 24 hours. You say, starting when? Okay, I'm going to redeem you in 70 years, starting when? And there were all sorts of calculations. And if you remember, we encountered some of those calculations. Belshazzar had his calculations. He took out the Klea Migdash, and we learned there the Midrash of when he took them out too early because he miscalculated, he was killed. We encountered it with Achashverosh, where we read in the Megillah, the first paragraph, Vekelim, Mikelim, Shonim, and the Midrash says he took out the Klea Migdash because he calculated the conclusion at one time. And so you can count 70 years from all sorts of different points. One place you can count them from, by the way, for 70 years, if you want to do it, is you can also count those 70 years, starting from the ascension of Nebuchadnezzar as our oppressor, from the Galut Yehoyakim. And if I go back to Galut Yehoyakim, 
598, already I'm getting very close to this time where Cyrus rises in power and is going to call us back. So we have all of this background information, and I know I've taken a long time to give it, but in summary, the Jews have been in exile, all the Jews. The Beit HaMikdash was destroyed 52 years earlier than when the Sefer opens up. Cyrus has begun his reign. The reign of Cyrus marks a significant departure from the Babylonian monarchs who had tried to exile people. Cyrus believes in the way to have loyal subjects is to give them a measure of religious freedom. He builds temples in his areas and we're gonna see he's going to allow us to rebuild our Beit HaMikdash. We know there's a 70 year peace that has to come into this. And the very last, and I keep on saying it's gonna be the last thing, the very last thing, remember, we don't know precisely where Megillat Esther falls in all of this because of the great uh, controversy regarding chronology. I've mentioned this book many times, uh, Jewish History and Conflict by Mitchell First. It is the um, best survey of all of the opinion, not all, you can never say all, but of many of the opinions that exist trying to explain the, uh, the difference between rabbinic and histor historical um, chronologies. It has, if I'm not mistaken, about a hundred and, uh, and some different explanations of this. Uh, all, all different opinions from saying that historians are wrong to Chazal is wrong, to Rav Schwab's piece, which I had shared with you, which he later recanted on late in life, which talks about the Chazal consciously hid the exact number of years because Chazal say that the entire Persian period was in the course of 52 years. According to historians, it was at least 207 years. We're missing most likely somewhere between 150 and 170 years in the chronology. So if you really say, we say we're 5,000, 782, we're actually right now somewhere in the 5,800 or 900 range, most likely the 900 range, somewhere around 5,9, and I didn't do the exact number, so I apologize, about 5,952, somewhere around there, we're getting very close to the end of the sixth millennia of Jewish history, which has all sorts of other agadic um, importance to it, that we're off on the numbers. So if you look on this chart, that I handed you, this large one. On that large chart, if you notice, Hatzarat Koresh, that Koresh comes, Cyrus comes out with his decree. On the outer margin of the, the, the right hand column, it says uh, 3390 or 539 BCE, and 524, it says is Nes Purim. If, however, I take the opinion of the historians, the entire story of Purim takes place after the building of the second Beit HaMikdash, which lends an entirely new perspective to it. Um, Professor uh, Joseph Tabor used to, used to explain, when I look at it, if I take the historians, I probably say this is the last piece, we take the historian's approach and that the story of Mordechai and Esther is after the building of the second Beit HaMikdash is, is 100 some years later, what ends up happening is, that maybe the book of Esther is a criticism of Jews who did not come back after the building of the Beit HaMikdash, as opposed to a story just of the Jews in exile. So where it falls is all very different. Is there a problem there that wasn't Darius was Esther's son, right? Only according to rabbinic chronology. Well, let's go with it for a moment. Okay. And then, then comes Cyrus. Well, so, so is, is well, actually, no, it's a different Darius. The Darius, we're talking about the Darius, according to rabbinic chronology, there's a number of Dariuses and a number of Ahasuerus. First of all, we don't know, according to rabbinic chronology, Ahasuerus most likely is not Xerxes, but Artaxerxes, Artaxashta, and not, um, and not uh, who we call Ahasuerus in, in, in Hebrew nowadays. Um, so number two is Darius the Mede is not to be confused with Darius who Chazal say was the son of Ahasuerus and Esther, so he's lower down on the chain. Chazal also don't normally account for Cambyses. Kanbuzi is one of the Persian kings within the calculation. And to be able to get all of the Persian kings into 52 years is really complicated. Um, but I don't want to get into that issue right now. 
but it, if you look at those different perspectives, it's also, it's a, just a fascinating piece is during the story of Ezra is our Mordechai and Esther basically contemporaries of Ezra or would they come later on in the history? Daniel is here at this time. And in fact, according to Chazal, we'll see the Sheish Batsar, according to some of Chazal is Daniel. We'll see that he makes an appearance here at the beginning of Sefer Ezra. Well, yes. So would Mordechai be a contemporary of Ezra? It depends how we understand that. In other words, if I take Chazal's chronology, yeah, Mordechai could have been exiled. And Vashti could have been the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Because we say she was the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. However, if I take historian's chronology, if you remember the way we did, we, we go down all of the children, Asher Heglam Yerushalayim, is it referring to Mordechai or is it referring to one of his ancestors earlier? It is, it is, uh, one more time. Okay, so one more time. This book has a very good summary of it. Uh, and it's, on, it's only about 200 pages long of summary and the best answer, by the way, uh, one of the answers, one of the answers, Beryl Wine gives an answer to all of this. He said, there is a discrepancy and Eliyahu will tell us how to answer it. Okay, and I don't want to get into it is the way he deals with it. Now, we know the description, discre discrepancy exists. Okay, let's open our, our, our nachim finally. Okay, we are now in Pasuk Aleph and we have a solid 20 minutes left for the shir. Maybe a little bit more. Uvshnat achat lechoresh. It is the first year of Koresh. Yes. What is that love doing there? Oh, good. So it's the very first year of Koresh. Rashi says that that vav, uvshnat, is actually tying it back to Sefer Daniel. And he says that that Ezra is the continuation, in a sense, to Perak Tet Pasuk Bet of Daniel. And in Sefer Daniel, we talked about the 70 years. That's 70 years from Yehoyakim, the third king before the end. Last one, Tzidkiyahu, Yehoyakim before him, and Yehoyakim before him. According to However, the Abarbanel and others, the Vav is actually tying it back to Divrei Hayamim, to the end of Divrei Hayamim. And so I didn't take a Tanakh, so you'll excuse my back for a moment, those who are watching. If you look at the end of Divrei Hayamim Bet, the very, very end, some of you are pulling it up, I see on your screens. Um, the end of Divrei Hayamim Bet ends as follows. Pasuk Chaf Bet, this is Perak Lamed Vav. Actually, I'm going to go back. Pasuk Chaf, end of Divrei Amin. Vayagel HaSheirit Min Acherev El Bavel. Those who remained from the war were exiled to Bavel. Viyu lo levanav lavadim ad maloch malchut paras. And they were, for him, they were um, slaves until the Persians took over. To fulfill what Yirmiyahu said about the 70 years, this is also referring to the punishment that we received for not having um, followed the laws of the sabbatical years. Since we didn't take sabbatical years, since we didn't follow Shemitah and Yovel, HaKodesh Baruch who made the land lie fallow for those Shemitahs and Yovels. Uvishnat, now look in your Sefer Ezra, and I'm going to read you in Sefer Divrei Amim. Uvishnat achat lechoresh melech paras, lechlot dvar Hashem befi Yirmiyahu, when the time had finished from what God had said to Yirmiyahu, heir Hashem et ruach koresh melech paras, God uh, uh, raised up or awoken, awoke the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he let out a decree in all of his monarchy, and also in writing, saying, 
Koamar Koresh, Melech Paras. Thus said Koresh, the king of Persia, Kol Mamlachot Aretz Natanli Hashem Eloke Hashem. I am all of the lands of the world. God has, the God of the heavens has given to me. V'hupfakad alay livnot lo bayit v'yerushalayim. Asher b'yudan, he commanded me to build a house in Yerushalayim, that is in Judea. Ki v'achem mikol amo Hashem Eloke v'imo v'yal. Because whoever and whoever is among you from your people, go up and make Ali, make Aliyah. Now, this, according to the Ibn Ezra, what's the Vav? This Vav is tying us into Divrei Ayamim. Divrei Ayamim, if you look in Bava Batra, where you talk about the authorship of the Sfarim, there are 24 Sfarim of Tanakh. The 24 Sfarim, one of them is called Ezra and Nehemiah. It's considered one book. How? We know it's not really one book, but it's counted as one of the 24. The Treasar is also counted. You know, the, 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 12, the 12 prophets, the prophets, the, minor, the small prophets are also counted as one book. So there's really more than 24 books of the Bible, but they're counted as one and it's counted as a continuation of the Rey Amin. So the Ibn Ezra, the Ibn, the Ibn Alam, sorry, says, wait a second, that's not it. The Uvishnat, because it's continuing the story. We're picking up straight from Divrei Amim. Our first two psukim are the same two psukim that are found at the end of Divrei Amim. It's, this is the continuation of the story. Writes the Malbim on this. Now we need to understand the 70 years. So which 70 years are there? So there were two 70 year counts we had, if you remember, in Yirmiyahu. In Yirmiyahu in 29, Yirmiyahu said on the 70 years, just find it. Um, I'm sorry, give me one second. Um, in Perak Chavtet. Okay, he said, Pasuk Yud, Ki Choamar Hashem, Ki Lefim Lot Lebavel Shivim Shana. It will be 70 years. To the Melot uh, Bavel, how do you translate it? To the fulfillment, fulfillment of Bavel, the, the totality of Bavel. However, if you look in Pasuk Perak Chafei Vaita Kol Aretz Azot LeChorba VeLeShama VeAvdu Goyim Ha'Elat Melech Bavel Shivim Shana, this land will be destroyed for seventy years. Vaihi Chimlot Shivim Shana of Kol Al Melech Bavel. So it seems to be there are almost two different counts that we have of 70 years when you look carefully at the language of Yirmiya. One is the destruction of the land, Chorbanabait, and one is to Bavel. Bavel could be the rise of Bavel. And so what ends up happening here, Daniel talks about Limlot Charvot Yerushalayim. Okay? What ends up happening here is this is the 70th year of Bavel, of the Babylonians coming into power. And that could be what's happening right now, according to the Malbim. This is what's really taking place. Let's go a little further in Pasuk Aleph for a moment. If you notice also, it says, Vishnat Achat Koresh Melech Paras. Okay, it was the first year. And when Koresh was the king of Paras, by the way, there is one more possibility of the Vav. The Dat Mikra suggests the Vav may be just a Vav like we find the Avraham Zaken Babi Yamim or the Elish Shemot, the Hamelech David Zaken, that it's not a classic Vava Chibur that's saying it's a continuation, but rather another stage. Okay, it could be just that kind of and the following happened. But it's the first year of Cyrus and his very first year, 589. And he says that there's, he puts out both. He puts out this information both in writing and orally. Thus says Koresh. Now the word ko, when we normally have ko amar, it's a navi. Ko amar Hashem tzvakot. Ko amar. Cyrus sounds like he's acting as a, in a prophetic fashion. Not only that, he talks about Hashem Elokei Hashemayim. The Persians believed in gods, 
but they had gods which were the greater gods. Ahuramaz, I always mispronounce his name, I apologize. Ahuramaz, Mazda was their god. He was the El Elyon they had, the, the, the chief god of all. We have, he goes ahead and he says, listen, I'm deferring to God, this God, Elokeh Shemaim, I'm talking about the God of the Jews. He's known as the God of the heavens. That's what he is. He isn't the God of the sun or the God of the moon or the God. He's the God of the heavens. And he's referring to him on this point in this way, because he had these ideas of these kinds of God. And what does he say? He says, in the army is a command. But remember, when we talked in Yirmiyahu about what's going to happen, we talked about Yirmiyahu, if called, God is going to remember. Cyrus is using, interestingly, some of the very same words that we've used in the prophecies that lead up to this. Rashi actually talks about the fact that we have to look and say for Yeshayahu to also have a piece. That Yeshayahu, and say for Yeshayahu, Perak Mem Dalid, Pasuk Chaf Dalid, we have this fascinating piece. And so if you turn there, if, you're, if you have it, Ko Amar Hashem, Okay, your meow is being told, you know, this is what God said, Goalecha, who is your redeemer? And the one who shaped you from the womb. I am doing all of these things. I, you know, I, um, I uh, undo all of the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the work of the liars and the magicians, I'm the one who's going to tell Yerushalayim it'll be settled and Yehuda will be built, and its, and its runes are going to be put up again. Why? Who says to the depths, okay, dry up, and I uh, and I will dry out your rivers. Haomer lechoresh roi, who says to Cyrus, my, he is my shepherd. Bekol chetzi yashlim, and all of these things will be fulfilled. Ultimately, this is before Cyrus has come into power, and Yeshayahu in a prophecy refers to Cyrus. Rashi notes uh, notes that vuhu pakad alai that when it says he remembered me, it's referring that Cyrus is referring to the prophecy of Yeshayahu that he became aware of. Now, right, if I printed out another two sheets for you, I will bring the, them up onto the screen in just a moment. For those who are on the screen, there are two sides to it. One side is English, one side, yeah, one side's English, one side is Hebrew. The first side I'm going to look at is the Hebrew, Yosifun. Now, Yosifun is a, um, a Jewish history that was based on translations of Josephus, of Latin translations of Josephus. It was probably written in the 10th century. So Josephus is during the Roman Wars, during the first century, okay? However, this is written in the 10th century. It's a Jewish source. And it was a source of history for much of Chazal. Rashi quotes Yosef and others quote Yosef. And he writes, and I have a little arrow drawn there for you. This is still talking about Belshazzar, the last of the Babylonian kings. Uh, when he killed, and he was killed, Belshazzar was killed by one of his officers while he was lying. And he cut off his head. And he ran over to the camp of Cyrus. And to Darius the Mede, who were the kings of Madai Paras. And he gave him the head. 
Yerushalayim, he talked about the fact that Belshazzar had brought out the, the temple uh, the, 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 the temple utensils, how he defiled them in, in the feast of wine, and there was this handwriting on the wall, Daniel explained what the handwriting on the wall, we learned about this in Sefer Daniel, and so the servant who kills Belshazzar says, look what God has done, he doesn't say, look what I did, he said, this is a fulfillment of a divine punishment. They bowed down to Hashem, Eloke Hashemayim, the same terminology we find here in the Sefer. Blessed is the God of these utensils. In the second column on the left side, he says, blessed is this God who did vengeance against, against the person who defiled the utensils, the Beit HaMikdash, because we've heard that you are the master over all of the world, and you are the, the God of all creation, and you've and the creator of the world. And now I know that you are greater than all other gods. Elohim. And you have the ability to, to remove kings and to establish kings. As He takes an oath then, Cyrus, to build and to send the exiles back to Yerushalayim. And he's going to do all of these things, bring them back to Yerushalayim. So why is Cyrus going to put out this command? According to Yosef, and he's doing it because he understood God, and he understood that he, that he somehow was put into place because God wanted him in place, and this was the way he was doing it. Flip to the other side of the page, to Josephus, okay? Now, this is 800 years earlier, 900 years earlier, actually, okay? And if you look at what Josephus writes, now again, Josephus is a Jew, okay? And Josephus had his traditions. Josephus had the Jewish traditions behind him. In the first year of the reign of Cyrus, point one, which was the 70th from the day that our people were removed out of their own land into Babylon. Not true. It was 52 years. God commiserated the captivity and the calamity of these poor people according as he had foretold to them by Jeremiah the prophet. We read the Yermiah before the destruction of the city that after they had served the Nebuchadnezzar and his posterity and after they had undergone the servitude 70 years, he would restore them again to the land of the fathers. They should build their temple and enjoy their ancient prosperity. And these things God afforded them. For he stirred up the mind of Cyrus and made him write this throughout all Asia. Thus said Cyrus the king, Koamar, right? Since God Almighty hath appointed me to be king of the habitable earth, I believe that he is the God which the nation of Israel is worshipped for. Indeed, he foretold my name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house of Jerusalem in the country of Judea. That's Pasuk Bet. This was known to Cyrus. Now, how did Cyrus know about this? Yosefun said he knew about it because he wanted to do some good for the Jews, because he saw that God was the one who defeated Belshazzar, the Babylonians for him, had, had him killed. This was known to Cyrus by his reading the book of Isaiah left behind him of his prophecies. No, Cyrus knew this because he learned, say, for Yeshayahu. For his prophet said that God had spoken thus to him in a secret vision. My will is that Cyrus, whom I have appointed to be king over many and great nations, send back my people to their land and build my temple. This was foretold by Isaiah 140 years before the temple was demolished. So if you think about it, we are 200 years after that prophecy of Yeshayahu, where he mentions Cyrus by name, that he's going to be the one doing it. Here comes Cyrus, 
Now, I don't know if Cyrus's mother read Yeshayahu and said, I'm going to call him Cyrus because I want him to do this. I don't know. Accordingly, when Cyrus read this and admired the divine power and earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfill that was so written. So he called for the most eminent Jews that were in the Babylon and said to them, he gave them to leave, to go back to their own country and to build their city of Jerusalem and the temple of the God. For that, he would be their assistant, that he would write to the rulers and governors that were in the neighborhood of the country of Judea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we find here is this interest peace and the traditions that the Jews had that Cyrus was a, um, an appointed one. I'm not going to call him an anointed one. He was an appointed one. This was God working through Cyrus. Now, it's not unusual for us to believe that God works through others to be able to create situations where people can accomplish amazing things. And so we see this with Cyrus, we see his terminology, we see Cyrus takes on the position that God had had him do this. He says this was God who had him do this, and we're running out of time, and I know that, but let's just do another couple of psukim. Who is here among all of you, okay? Who is ready? To go up to Yerushalayim, that's in Yudah. And you will build the, God, the house of God in Yerushalayim. Now notice, there are actually two parts of this command that he's giving. The first part says, who's going on Aliyah? And the second part actually says, those of you who are going on Aliyah, who's going to build the God, God's God's uh, house. There is a, uh, a national aspiration and a religious aspiration that's taking place in this very same passage. But there is one more piece that has to happen. That those, and there's two different ways of explaining this word nishar. Nishar is remain, right? So Rashi says, listen, Anyone who's not making Aliyah, who's not going to help in this effort, you got to help. You have to contribute silver, gold, property, animals. You have to start contributing. You know, start giving. This is an appeal. Who's making the appeal, though? Cyrus is making the appeal. Interestingly, the Dat Mikra says that actually um, that this v'chol hanish'ar is really another terminology to those people who are in the galut. That it's not those who are left behind, but it means this, your population, the Jewish diaspora has to help. This has to be a project of the Jews to settle the land and build the Beit HaMikdash. There's a small difference between these two approaches. However, what you also have to notice is what we're sending them out, we're sending them out with Kesef and Zahav. Think of the first Galut, Galut Mitzrayim. That when we left Mitzrayim, we went Berchush Gadol. Now we're leaving Bavel and we're leaving Berchush Gadol. The difference is going to be, and we'll see this at the end of this parak and next parak, which is going to be a demographer's dream because it's only names, but we'll see that the number of people who are actually going is going to be a small portion of the people. And this will be the first time in Jewish history where there will be a, the majority of Jews in the diaspora versus the minority of Jews in Eretz Yisrael. Again, something that we can associate with, even though today, most likely it has most recently been flipped where the majority of Jews are most likely in Eretz Yisrael today versus being in the Gula. We're going to stop here. Next week, we'll finish off Perak Aleph, we'll get, and we'll do Perak Bet as well. Thank you. Thank you.